Uh, welcome. Welcome to episode 116 of Wool and Spinning. My name is Rachel and um, I can be found pretty much everywhere as well for pearls. So today we are doing, um, we're live, we're doing the live stream today and I can see that I'm a bit out of focus. Give me a little bit of book chatter today, but I have, oh, <laughs> so our printer is on the fritz. So that's fun. <laughs> it just won't print. Um, there's tons of ink in the cartridge and in the printer, but for whatever reason, it won't actually physically put the ink from the cartridge onto the paper and put the paper through the printer so that I can actually receive said. Anyways, I'm going to be looking at the screen quite a bit because um, I couldn't print my show notes. So welcome everyone. Oh, thank you for the kind words, Felicia. Hi, Karma. Uh, hi, Erica. It's good to see you. I just got to talk to you like the other day, so it's nice to see you here again. Um, what do we have in store for today's show? We have a lot of stuff to talk about. So there's not going to be any spinning growth today, and there's not going to be any ask anything today because I have so many projects to share with you and so much to talk about. We may or may not get through them all, so if we don't, I'll just save it for next show. We have three live streams in May because we missed one in March because of Charlotte's um, untimely dying. So <laughs> we, uh, I just didn't have it in me and then spring break was uh, on us. So I ended up not doing a second live stream in March. So today's show is brought to you by Color Storms as well. And, um, and then there will be also three shows this month. So that's kind of exciting. Um, so what do we have to talk about today? We have... Let me look at my digital notes. Um, I've got some hand spun that I finished that I would like to share with you. I have two finished items. So I have a little pattern that I uh, did over I the weekend. whipped up a little something that I wanted to share with you. And then I have a massive woven project that I'm really excited to talk about. And actually, it's really cool that Felicia is here today because uh, the project has something to do with Felicia. So... <laughs> Um, that was that's really cool that Felicia's here and then um, I have a couple of works in progress that I want to talk about and I think that will take us to the end of the show so I do have a quick giveaway to announce let's do that first let's do giveaways first and I just realized that I don't have the patron giveaway let me just I wrote her name down somewhere I already messaged her she already knows that she won a calendar it was for the calendar giveaway it was Christine so I've already messaged her on patreon and for those who are new to the show this is the calendar that we give away it this one this particular one starts in June of this year and um, it's just meant to be an inspirational thing to put on your desk at work or in your office or in your studio and um, Christine that will be going in the mail for you once I get your mailing address now, we also had Lynn of West Coast Color. She had sponsored a giveaway, and this ran through March and April because of just life getting in the way. And I had asked you to discuss your favorite patterns for hand spun in the episode thread over on Ravelry. And if you haven't had a chance to look at that thread, I would highly recommend going over and having a look at all of the posts because the patterns that people posted uh, were just awesome ideas. And I was going to give away, I was going to give away, um, this is 113 grams of Biffle. It's 100% blue face lister from Lynn. And then also this one is 100 grams of 80% BFL and silk. So she calls this her Biffle a -Soa. And I only drew one name. So... <laughs> Duh. Uh, Prairie Bird Fire, which is Sherry in the Ravelry group. If you want to let me know which one you want, and then next show we'll draw for the other one from that same thread. So if you haven't entered in the March, April episode thread for your favorite hand spun pattern, please do. And you might still win. Now I have BFL in my mouth. Ugh. I can feel it on my tongue. Maybe I should just swallow it. Yeah, Lynn's fiber is amazing and her colors are incredible. Um, so 
yeah, if you guys haven't checked out West Coast Color, um, Casey was just saying that how how the fiber is so pretty, and she dyes her her, her dyeing is is just beautiful. Um, you can find her at westcoastcolor.net. So this is westcoastcolor.net. So if you have not checked out her website and you do not know about Chris and Lynn, please check them out at westcoastcolor.net. She's local to me. She's just up here in Tappan, BC, about three hour, about two and a half, three hour drive from here. And uh, yeah, she's just, she's just awesome. <laughs> Erica says in the live chat, I have the best mugs. So this one is massive, like it's as big as my head. And I saw it, I never buy stuff when we're away camping or like we never go into the tourist shops. And I, I suspect as the kids get older, we will. And this one says Rocky Mountains, Jasper, Canada. And what, a, and so the, the mug was in the window this way and it came with a little spoon. There's a hole here. Uh, but the spoon broke because Nora dropped it on the pavement, but that's okay. And I saw it sitting there like this, and it's totally like my colors. And I circled back, and I was looking at it, and then we walked away a bit, and then I, we circled back, and I said to Mike, this was this past summer, and I said to Mike, I, I really want that mug. <laughs> He's like, then go get it. So I did. <laughs> and then when I got into the store, I saw that it had the writing on it, and I was kind of bummed because the mug itself is so beautiful. So the nice thing is, is that as it, every time it gets washed, the writing has been coming off. So like it's very slowly, the writing is, is getting removed. So I'm hoping that over time, you guys can see like the S in mountains is almost gone. And Canada is missing a whole bunch of its black. So I'm hoping that over time, it just like wears off <laughs> and goes away. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Erica. You're so funny. I love big mugs. I like big, deep mugs. I don't like um, cappuccino mugs, like or soup mugs that are like wide and shallow because the coffee cools down too fast. But I really like big, deep mugs. Like this mug holds a Starbucks, a regular size Starbucks tumbler of coffee. It, it, the whole thing fits in here. That's how big this is. So, anyhow, I have a couple of them. I love them. Um. Okay, why don't we get into the show because I have so much to share with you. Color Storms offers a surprising variety of colors and bright shades made of natural dyes. I offer two kinds of worsted weight yarn that comes in both solids and gradient sets. My fingering yarn is a soft wool nylon blend that comes in gradient sets and multicolored sock sets called Playful Pairs. Last year I started dyeing fiber as well. It's all on my website colorstorms.com. On Instagram, you can see my latest dye work and experiments. So I have the book I am going to talk about the book. Just give me, let's talk about some of the other stuff first. <coughs> and then I'll share the book with you. Because I have a couple things I want to say about the book. And um, yeah. So let's talk about this spin in progress. I'm just going to move my show notes around. And this is a spin. That, so what I've been doing, I, I changed how I prep for the show and I've been putting everything in my basket. So then I have everything for the show in one spot. Cause I find sometimes you guys know this every so often I'll be like, Oh, I forgot X, Y, Z, you know, I left it wherever. And so I've been, what I've started doing is actually putting it in the basket and it cannot come out of the basket until I've talked about it on the show and then it can get put away. So this is a work in progress. I got a ton of it done last night because Mike went to see the end game, the Avengers end game, the last, the last movie in this story arc. If you follow the Avengers stuff, um, I, I actually don't, and I have no idea what's going on in all of the movies. And I stopped watching after, I don't even know. I saw the first Captain America movie and then I saw the Avengers movies. But then after that, like I missed all of the like Gardens of the Galaxy and I missed like 
all of those like adjunct movies. Anyways, Mike is a big fan and he went on opening night. So he got a seat and went and saw it and came home and then our neighbors were talking about it because they're huge fans of that, of just Marvel and uh, comic books in general. And so they were talking about it and they were saying, and they haven't seen it yet. And Mike was like, oh, it's so great. Like you have to go, blah, blah, blah. And so Paula was like, well, why don't the four of us go? Like we'll go on a date night later in May. We'll each get a babysitter for our respective kids and then the four of us can go. So Mike was like, oh, that's such a great idea. Yes, let's do it. So he's got it all booked and he's got the date booked and everything. But now he's decided that I can't go unless I catch up on all the movies. <laughs> so we were watching the Winter Soldier last night, the Captain America Winter Soldier, and I got this much done on my sock. <laughs> so I actually am ready to start the gusset. Um, so let me talk about this project a little bit. So this is a bat that I actually um, bullied Katrina into making for me. So if you guys don't know who Katrina is, she's Crafty Jacks, and she runs Crafty Jacks Boutique. And she, I asked her if I could have a bat that was uh, about 100 grams. I didn't care if it was a little bit more or a little bit less. And I asked her if I could have, a, have this bat and then, and I needed it to be like a long wool of some kind with mixed with something. So I, I needed it to be with mohair. So I didn't care what long wool she used and I didn't care what the ratio was and the percentages, but I wanted it to have mohair in it. So she made me a bat of about 80, 20 mohair Wensleydale and she used a bunch of Wensleydale that I think she had dyed up from club a while ago that was sort of just left that there was sort of enough to do what I had asked her to do and so I took the bat and I divided it all up and each of these nests I've been spinning to a bobbin this bobbin's done and then this bobbin was leftovers from my first skein and the colors are just beautiful. I had showed you guys this bat on the show at some point. I just said like, here's a quick teaser of this. It's gonna get spun at some point. And I just left it at that. I guess it was from the last show. Was it the last show? Kelly, you have a better memory than me. Uh, it must have been the last show or maybe even an earlier show in April. Anyhow, I divided it all up. The sheen on this yarn is just amazing. Like if I hold it back so you guys can really see in the light, um, it just like sparkles. It's really pretty. The stitch definition is pretty, pretty awesome. I'll zoom in so that you guys can see. I don't want to switch the cameras around just yet because I need the cameras actually big for something else that I'm going to show you guys. But the... Um, you can see the stitch definition is really beautiful. And I'm knitting these on 2.25 millimeter needles. So originally I thought that maybe I should go up on, sorry, the yarn's all caught on the table. I thought that maybe originally I should go up to 2.5 millimeter needle. But then as I started knitting on the toe, I was glad that I hadn't knit anything bigger than a 2.5 to five because I did wash this yarn and it really it didn't plump up quote unquote like we would expect in the fine wools and those of you who are participating or following along with the 51 yarns spin along um, that we that we're doing in the Ravelry group uh, sorry on on Patreon I think it was February that was the long and down wools and we talked about, there was a little bit of chatter in the Ravelry group about how the long wools just don't poof. They don't get really springy. And this yarn didn't poof up or spring up. Maybe I will switch the cameras around because then you guys can really see. Let me just see what, what Eve said there. With Wensleydale, can you knit stockinette stitch socks? Does it have enough memory or would you need ribbing? I have Teeswater Wensleydale blend and I want to use it for socks. You know, I this is why I'm making these socks actually, Eve. Um, it's funny that you would ask that because these are stockinette and they seem to have, sorry, everything's rolling off my table. I'm not really sure why, but it seems to want to migrate off the table. So I'm not really sure 
Like, so far, um, these have quite good memory, like, and they're quite sturdy. Yeah, the poof comes from the crimp, that's right. Like, even just putting these on my hand right now as I, as I lean over, hi, <laughs> you can have a little sock puppet show. Um, even having it on my hands, like, it's got a certain firmness to it that uh, my fine wool socks don't. So even just having it on my hands, it feels a bit coarser and a little bit, it's definitely fuzzy. The halo on this, these are quite amazing. I don't know if you can see that around the toe. It's really, really, really fuzzy. And as I've been knitting on them last night, it was funny because when the, um, when the movie was over, um, I looked down at my lap because I was knitting in bed and I was wearing a white or sorry, a black, um, tank top and you could see all like basically from here down to my like waist it was just fuzz and it's it's I think it's the mohair because it wasn't um it was shorter stapled and they were quite curly and they just looked it looked like mohair to me but the fabric itself has a certain crispness to it that my other um stuff just doesn't have to the same extent. Like I would say this is a little bit closer to the Hauser yarn socks than to some of the other socks that we, that I have been knitting recently. So I'm glad that I didn't go up to a 2.5 millimeter needle because definitely for sure, this is the finished yarn, that definitely for sure it would have been too, too loosely knit. But I'm also kind of glad that I didn't go down to two millimeter needles because I feel like it would have been too dense because this fabric is a little bit denser than some of my other finely spun three-ply yarns. This is a three-ply. I should have said it's a three-ply. And the funny thing is, is like the twist angle is not super severe. Like if you can see that um, under my finger there, like that twist angle is sort of, you know, it's not, it's not super aggressive. Like it's sort of around probably about 45 degrees. I don't think I have my protractor right here. Maybe I do. I'm not sure. I've been cleaning up. If you guys follow me on Instagram, um, the uh, I had posted some photos on my personal account of my cleanup. We were moving furniture around and we... Um, Yeah, we moved furniture around and I um, I cleaned everything out and I pulled it all out and I, I've really been trying to um, rearrange some stuff and just, just clean up the house a little bit. It's been, oh, it's been so cathartic getting all the dog hair out of the house. It's just been amazing because um, we still had a lot of dog hair. All right, let's have a look at this. So I would say that this is about... 30 degrees, maybe 25, 28. It's not a super, super severe twist angle. I'd say this is about a 25 degree twist angle. And the interesting thing is if I had taken it up and spun it more like this, let me just twist this one more time, and made it more like a 40 degree, 40 degree twist angle. I hope you guys can still hear me on the mic because I am moving away from it a little bit here. Um, if you need me to move the mic, I can. That would be just a little bit less than 40. Let's tighten it up a little bit. That's sort of more like 40 degrees right there. That is such a different yarn than what I started with. And look at that twist in there. Like look at how it, how it, how it curls up on itself. That's really crazy. Like that would be a really hard yarn to knit with because it would be like the Hauser yarn. It'd be constantly curling as you were knitting. Whereas, and any more than that, I'm not sure you would want to put any more, any more twist in it than that. Like that's even, even worse. And that's probably like a 50 degree twist angle about that. Um, yeah, that's about 50 degrees. So the yarn that I ended up with, even though it was still, so when I pulled the skein off of the 
did I use my skein winder or my nitty knotty? I think I used my skein winder for this. So when I pulled it off of the skein winder, it still twisted uh, two and a half times. So it still had more twist in it than I needed. And so then when I washed it, it evened out into a just a really nice um, hanging, hanging skein. And like my singles aren't, they're quite nicely twisted. Like look at that. This has been resting for quite a few days and it's still curly cueing on itself. Like those singles have quite a bit of twist in them. So I would consider this, the singles of this yarn to be a high twist singles. And I would consider, I would probably say that this is a medium twist ply because a low twist ply for lace. So if I had done a high twist singles and a low twist ply for lace yarn, to get those yarn overs to really open up, I would have left it like this. Hang on, I gotta grab the yarn. I would have left it more like that and I would have left it with a twist angle of about 10 degrees. And instead, I applied it to about 30. So I would say this is a high twist singles with a medium twist ply, yeah. We haven't done a yarn, um, what's that word, uh, analysis for a while. It's good to, it's good to do this. I'm, I, I love this kind of stuff. This is what we do in like the Thoughtful Spinner and the How I Spin content. This, these are the conversations that we have in, in that content. So it's kind of fun. All right, let me just catch up on the chat. I think I'm all, I think I'm good though. Welcome Kathleen. Yarn dissection, good good one, Becca. We haven't we haven't done that for a while, where we've like gone through and talked about talked about how I constructed a yarn. The other thing that I will say is because of the Wensleydale, so this was a carded prep, and I spun this. This is very timely. So for May, which the content was just released today, because we're streaming this on May first. Um, for May, we're looking at true worsted and true woolen yarns in the 51 yarns spin along in the uh, community. So on the Slack channel and the Patreon. And we, so all month we're going to be looking at true worsted and true woolen and what makes a yarn true worsted and what makes a yarn true woolen. And then next month we're going to follow through chronologically in the book and then we're going to look at semi worsted and semi woolen. So I have a question for you guys out there in chat. Would you consider this yarn, and don't cheat and go look at your 51 yarns book, would you consider this yarn, so it was spun, so it was prepped as a bat by Katrina. She dyed it and then she carded it up for me. And I spun it with a short forward draw, drafting forward and smoothing the fibers back. And then I plied it as a traditional three ply by rewinding the singles to the first spun end and plying from the first spun end. So would you guys consider this a semi-worsted yarn or a semi-woolen yarn? And don't look at your book and don't 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 cheat. <laughs> Just whatever comes to the top of your head. I was supposed to have a haircut this morning and my hairdresser had to cancel and um, reschedule for next week so I'm sorry that my bangs are really in my eyes it's it's annoying for me but I know it's distracting all right oh you guys have some great answers okay so I'm gonna read them out uh, Kelly says semi worsted Becca says semi woolen as I tend to go with prep as the bassist Eve says semi woolen because it's semi is a woolen prep um, Megan says woolen prep worsted spun I can never remember which is which Semi-woolen, I weigh prep higher than draft. Semi-woolen, I think. I would go semi-woolen. <laughs> Kelly says, LOL, I'm wrong, I think. <laughs> Nobody's wrong. Okay, so what I would say is that this yarn is a semi-woolen yarn. And the reason is because it's a, it was a woolen prep. Now, this is where it gets really interesting, and this is why I thought that I would pose this question to you guys, because... It was a semi woolen prep because it was a bat. However, it was a smooth bat and it came off of the carter so incredibly smooth 
there was very few places where the fibers, yes, they're misaligned and yes, they're not super, super um, intact, like, or um, sorry, parallel. But if you look at it, and I'll see if I can do this under the camera. So I'm sorry that I'm blurry, but it's because I'm leaning over. Um, when I pre-drafted this prep and pulled it out, it realigned the fibers. But it's still not true worsted because it's not from, it's not hand combed and it's not butt to tip and it, or sorry, but tip to butt. And it's not in any kind of um, organized alignment. But this prep could be, even though it's woolen, like you see how when you draft it out, and I'll see if I can get this in focus, you see how when you draft it out, like the fibers go parallel really beautifully? They parallel themselves. So I think that's where it gets really confusing because you could argue that because this was a smooth bat and you can pre-draft it and make the fibers really aligned and then you're spinning it worsted, you and then you've got this like really smooth worsted yarn, you could argue, and I don't think that you would be wrong, you could argue that it's a semi-worsted yarn because the, you can make the bat a smooth bat. However, I would consider this yarn a semi-woolen yarn spun in a worsted fashion with a worsted finish because I didn't thwack it, I snapped it, and I tried to keep it as smooth as possible by rewinding my bobbin so that I was plying from the first spun end and keeping those fibers really smooth. And the funny thing is, because it's long wool and because it's wet, uh, mohair, it's still really fuzzy and super haloed, which we talked about uh, a few minutes ago. So I, I don't think that any is necessarily wrong. Most people go based on the prep. So if it's a woolen prep, it's a semi-woolen yarn. And if it's a worsted prep, it's a semi-worsted prep. But I would like to argue that you need to be really consistent with how you label your yarns. And then you know what you mean when you're talking about stuff. So if you say to yourself, yeah, this is kind of a semi-worsted yarn and you know why you call it a semi-worsted yarn and you can explain that to another spinner, you're not wrong. So I would say that this is a semi-woolen yarn with a worsted draft and a worsted finish. That's what I would say. Uh, let me just catch up with chat because you guys have a couple of really great things to say. Can we lead the charge to start calling worsted something different? My students in Learn to Spin were so confused. Worsted prep, worsted draft, worsted weight yarn. Oh my goodness, totally. <laughs> I was so confused about all of that when I first came to spinning. It was probably one of the biggest things that once I figured it all out was a big aha moment. And actually it's funny because I talk about that in the Thoughtful Spinner PDF for the true worsted download this month. Uh, I actually talk about like when I was a new spinner and reading a blog post by Jared Flood when he was still blogging at uh, brooklyntweed.blogspot.com when he really, when he was first starting out and he very first had that blog. And I remember reading about worsted yarns, worsted spun yarns versus worsted weight yarns and just going, what? And I still think about that blog post to this day because it wasn't until years later that the aha light bulb went on and I was like, oh, that's what he was talking about. So it's really, yeah, it's, it's too much of the same word. Naming is super confusing. There are too many semi yarns to be specific with just two terms. I think that's really true, Becca. I'd rather just hear prep and draft listed rather than a semi label. Yeah, that's so true. Um, it's very helpful. I remember my friend Diana Twist and I having this conversation when I was first coming back to spinning and we were getting my wheel up and running again. And I remember talking to her and JC Boggs Faulkner had re uh, shortly thereafter released her Craftsy video, Worsted to Woolen, which I think is still available on Blueprint if I'm not mistaken. And I remember her... Diana and I talking about that and saying it's probably more helpful to say this was from comb top commercially dyed or hand painted by an indie dyer and because sometimes that changes how the comb top spins because it can be a little bit more beaten up versus really well handled not to make generalizations but it happens and uh, and then spun with a short forward draft, allowing the twist to enter the fiber supply using a pinch and pull method. Like that is way clearer. 
and then finished with a snapping snap and thwack approach whatever you want to say it's way clearer if you're if you want to take the time to really read that and understand what the person who spun it is saying all right can we make a woolen yarn that is not wool the answer there is yes I think you're putting me on the spot, Meg. You're really uh, testing my knowledge. I would say yes, because cotton is spun using a woolen prep generally. You make punies and you spun it long draw. And so that would be a woolen yarn. Um, so yes, woolen doesn't necessarily mean that it's spun from wool. Woolen is, is the uh, prep and the spinning technique. Um, in the UK and Australia, we use four ply and eight ply as yarn weight terms, then try and teach new spinners. It's super confusing. It's so funny because the first time that I came across the term four ply was my Auntie Vaughn. She was saying, oh, I'm knitting this baby jacket and it's a four ply yarn and done. And she was talking about this and I was like, what is it? And by then I was spinning and I was like, what does it matter if it's four ply? Like, who cares? Is it sport weight? Is it DK? And I remember having that whole conversation with her and going into the yarn shop with her later that day and because she needed to get more of the yarn and her saying to the yarn shop owner oh I need more of this four ply and I looked at the yarn and I was like oh it's like a weight so that was really confusing all right worst okay so the worsted to woolen video is still available on blueprint I think that video that class I think that's going to become a classic to be honest with you like doing a little bit of forecasting and and um Predict, prediction, I think that class by JC is probably going to become a classic in the spinning world. It was just such a fantastic video. It was filmed really well. It was explained really well. She broke it down really nicely. I think there's a lot of things in the class that she covered for the beginning spinner that really made things clear as mud. I think it's going to become a classic. I would love to see it released separately from a subscription service like Blueprint that you could buy just the DVD or buy the download or whatever people are watching things on nowadays. I'd love to see it be separate so that people have access to it. Oh, good point. Uh, Kiviet and other downs are wool woolen spun as well. Cashmere is always spun woolen. Yes, and it, cashmere needs so much twist. So generally spinning it long draw is the way to go. Anything really short stapled is much easier to spin woolen. Yes, totally agree. All right. Yeah, such great stuff. All right, I'm going to put these away because like I said, we've got a lot to talk about and I really, so this is in progress. I'm hoping to have it finished soon and um, I'll be able to share the, um, I only got, I will say before I put this away completely, um, this, Wensleydale is quite a dense fiber and it's quite a heavy fiber. It's like Gotland or Teeswater. So you're not going to get the same yardage necessarily that you would get from like four ounces of Merino or four ounces of Targi or Cormo or whatever. So if, so this is uh, 50 grams. I think it ended up being like 52 grams or something when I, when I weighed it and it's only 150 yards. So it's a three ply yarn and it's very finely spun. Like I said, I could have gone down to two millimeter needles on my socks and it's only 150 yards. So in the 100 gram skein, I, I expect to only get about uh, 300 yards of fingering weight yarn and that's not great yardage for me. So um, when, when, when I compare it directly to like Targi or Merino or BFL, even BFL, I don't tend to get as much from 100 grams as I do from like Merino. So that is something to take into account with these slightly denser, heavier fibers. You don't physically get as much fiber as you do. And so you're not going to have the same yardage. So if you're new to spinning socks and you're having trouble getting that yardage because you're not spinning really, really, really super finely just yet, I would really recommend buying a little bit extra if that's something that you're still playing with and learning about. And then you're not worried that you're not going to have enough yardage for your socks. Because the worst thing is that you get to the end of your socks and you go to knit your second one and you can only get like halfway up the leg. So just something to think about. You can still buy individual classes on Blueprint. You get 
a free one forever class with each month. Oh, I didn't know that. That's kind of cool. Oh, hi, Judy. Welcome. Um, okay, so you can still buy individual classes on Blueprint. You get a free one forever class, own forever class with each month of a Blueprint subscription. Oh, that's great to know. I, I have to admit, I haven't really looked into Blueprint. I had all of these classes on Craftsy before they became Blueprint and I just didn't switch everything over and I haven't got a subscription. It's just too many places to for me to keep my track of all my stuff. So I sort of let that go. But I know that there's a lot of value there and I know a lot of people have really enjoyed um, that their subscriptions. All right, let's move on. I do have Fiber Club for from Crafty Jacks for May. So I'm gonna share that with you really quick. It is absolutely beautiful. I'm not sure that this is gonna get spun. I might just keep it forever. <laughs> it's a bat. Isn't that gorgeous? It's Carolet. Charolet? How do you say that? Eve, are you still around? How do you say that? Um, yeah, it's just beautiful. I'm not sure how I'm gonna spin this. I might end up yeah, I know they're all still there, Kelly, and I know my account is still there. I just haven't made it active. Like, I haven't gone and signed in and gotten it all organized. That's all. Um, yeah. Char Olay. Thank you, Becca. Char Olay. Uh, it's just beautiful. It is so springy. Uh, <laughs> so Katrina and I were talking yesterday because we were signing all the books because all the books are signed. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Oh, sorry. The camera so that's our we're, we've signed them all so we were signing and then she pulls this out and I was like <laughs> so I it's so springy and so bouncy talk about completely different from the Wensleydale I'm not totally sure how I'm gonna spin this because it's a gradient it basically goes from this gorgeous seafoam green all the way around to sort of a tawny browny orangey peachy kind of uh, color and I want to keep that intact so it'll definitely be spun as a gradient but I'm not sure or is that ombre when you're going from different colors is it ombre I always get them mixed up gradient I always think of as going through the shades and ombre is like going through color anyways I'm gonna keep this intact so I just need to figure out am I when I un, when I undo the the bow Am I going to just take off strips of fiber um, here? Like, so strip, strip, strip. And then this would be like where it blends and then carry on. And then chain ply, leave it as singles. I don't know. I kind of just want to frame it and put it on the wall <laughs> like this. Put it up on the wall in one of those like 3D uh, frames, you know? And so it'll just like sit there. <laughs> on the wall <laughs> it's just so pretty gradient is different color ombre is different shades and tints of the same color oh thanks Eve I knew I had them backwards um, I'm actually quite tired I'm sort of a bit <laughs> feeling a bit all over the place today so thank you so uh, gradient and I would like to keep that intact so I'm trying to figure out how to do that all right do you guys want to talk about more spinning or do you want to talk about a little bit of weaving and then come back to spinning? Oh, so when I was doing the, um, oh, weaving. Okay. Um, I can't do both at the same time. <laughs> They're totally different. Um, when I was doing my clean out and when I was doing, um, yeah, just doing the clean out, I found all of my old um, sample cards. Isn't that crazy? So I... I used to cut them, so I used to do like little like um, pigtail things, and then I'd cut them and just have them like like this, and I found them all. Isn't that crazy? So now I have to decide what to do with them all. It's just crazy, crazy amount of spinning, tons of sampling. Yeah, but I found them, and I want to show you guys. Okay, let's talk about a little bit of weaving. I made 
Charlay singles a couple years back and it was so great. Oh, okay, that's good to know, Becca. Maybe I will do that. Maybe I'll do some some um, some singles. So I've been borrowing the Louette Jane, which is a table loom from my friend um, Jeanette. <laughs> and she put the we put this warp on together. And um, it was just this little teeny tiny warp. And um, they were gonna be little like rug, rug mats. And a bunch of them didn't turn out. But the warp was white with two stripes. And um, I cut it off. And I decided and I threw them out, like I or like I threw them aside. I, I wasn't going to do anything with it. I was going to just throw them out. It was over like three feet of warp. And then when I was cleaning up, I was like, well, maybe I should look and see what they look like. So I went and looked and saw what they look like. And I kind of liked them. I thought they were kind of cute. It's 4-8 uh, cotton. And I even have one like cozy like one of the longer ones you know so like this one's meant to be able to have like two two mugs or like two small two small um like you could put your mug on the one side and then um you could have like your spoon or a little side um plate anyways i threw out half of them because they were so poorly made and i was playing around with tension and i was playing around with my beat and they just didn't turn out but i took the whole strip because i didn't cut them off in between i just took the whole strip the it was almost three yards and i threw them in the washing the washing machine the washing machine and then i threw them into the dryer and i just sort of thought well come with me and um this is what, and then these ones were the ones that I kept. So I cut them all apart after they came out of the dryer and I, I cut them all apart, just rough cut. Um, I took my gingers and I just cut them apart and I had about, um, probably about three inches of, uh, or maybe about two inches of, of warp in between each. So they were sort of on the loom like this and I cut them, rough cut them in between. And then after I had pressed each of them and had ironed them, then I used my rotary cutter and my my um, my rotary cutter and I I cleaned them up and then it, they were they're all fringed. Isn't that fun? I don't know what I'm gonna do with them. I think I'm gonna just put them in a little bowl on one of our side tables and maybe over time they'll get used. But I played around with warp. So this one had the teal warp. This one had a navy blue warp. I was just playing. So, they're so British. That's right. <laughs> You're right, Megan. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Everybody's saying that they really like them. Yeah, a mug and a biscuit. Exactly. Mug and a cookie. Exactly. Like, it's just sort of like a like a little mug rug. Jeanette calls them um, lover's rugs, uh, The these ones that are bigger, because um, you can put two mugs for two people on them. But I was playing with twill here. So, I didn't have any selvage. Um, so, I had to keep figuring out sort of which where to throw the shuttle because I didn't have a floating salvage uh, but this is a 2 2 twill. Um, and you'll never you'll so I don't I didn't know how to do um, twill at the time but I was watching a YouTube video of her talking about one of the looms that I am interested in like floor looms and she happened to be and then she flipped over to her table loom and she was talking about the differences between her table loom and her floor loom and what she likes about her table loom and what she likes about her floor loom. And she was weaving a tutu twill on her table loom. And so I was watching her go through the the petal, like the petals of the floor of the table loom. And I was like, oh, it's just one, two, two, three, three, four, four, one, one, two, and so on. And I was like, so I just started doing it. And so then I ended up with this. <laughs> so this is plain weave. And then I went into the 2 2 12 because I was watching that video. And then I went back into plain weave to match it to finish. So you hem stitch, don't put any weft in at all, advance the loom, then hem stitch and start the new one. Yeah, exactly, Kelly. So when I, well, I don't know if that's right or not. I just did it. So I, um, I would uh, do two rows of, weft, hem stitch it, weave, and then I hem stitch, advance the warp a little bit, 
I usually had to advance the warp before that anyways, but I advanced it again. Throw, uh, do two rows of weft, hem stitch it, and then keep on going. I hope that makes sense. To the weavers out there, it makes sense. So yeah, anyways, they're just really fun. There's tons of mistakes in them. I didn't do my ends properly on the sides and some of them over time probably will come undone, but in the meantime, I can use them and enjoy them. And it was my very first weaving project off of a, Erica, I hope that I have this right, off of a harness loom. So it's kind of fun. Is that right, a harness loom? Because it's a table loom. Eight shaft, I was using four for plain weave, for tabby weave. Can you put in a strip of cardboard or something so you'd have something to weave against when you start the next one? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, shaft. So it's my first shaft shaft weaving project. Thanks, Erica. <laughs> I knew I had it wrong as soon as I said it. Um, I guess you could. I don't know if, like, I don't know. I, I, I guess so. I, I didn't, but I guess you could. Um... Maybe, maybe one of the experienced weavers can answer that if maybe putting a strip of cardboard in between would be the way to go to keep, to keep on going. Because actually, to be honest with you, I really don't know. Back to spinning. So I received this fiber about three years ago from my friend Nina, who lives in Santiago in Chile. And this is Bastador, and I've talked about it before. And I wish my Spanish was better, but basically it says handcrafted Patagonian wools, but I would love to be able to say it in Spanish properly with the accent and all the things. Um, Lanis de la Patagonia, but I would like to be able to say it like the way that they say it. Anyways, she sent me this sort of gradient, um, and it goes from the okra yellow across to, this looks black, but it's a very dark blue black. And it's a merino merino Coriadale cross that she blends and then she dyes them and um, this is the fiber. So I had spun the gray one back in 2017 and um, I had spun it up really quickly. I had taken one of these braids and I had just divided it in half, stripped each half down, spun it to a bobbin and plied it. And I ended up with this gray. And I talked about it on the show back in 2017. So those who are just working their way through the episodes from the beginning and some of the episodes are fresh in your mind, you might remember me talking about this. But those who, like me, haven't seen those episodes for several years, um, you won't remember. So this was the first one. And then I immediately took this one which was the light yellow it's kind of a you can see it here it's sort of a lighter golden yellow whereas this one is a little bit brighter it's more of like what I would call an okra yellow I took this one and I did the same thing I divided it in half stripped it down and then put it on my spindles and that was the end of it so I spun one half of the fiber and then ever since then it has sat on my spindles so I've been spinning this on my Turkish spindles and um, that's it they've just been on my Turkish spindles for for the last uh, two years uh, it's just been sitting and then a couple of weeks ago I was starting the clean out oh you guys have lost the feed but it came back immediately. My feed has been fine. Um, make sure you guys that you refresh if you're having problems. If you're if you lost your feed, just refresh. And if you lost the link, here it is. I put it into the live chat. Um, so I took the uh, yeah, so I took the, so it's just been sitting. So a couple weeks ago when I first started to clean things up, clean things out, I was going through all of my bags and I found this project and I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. I really need to like do something about this spin. And so I finished it. So I just forced myself every time I was outside, every time I was standing on the balcony with the kids, every time we went to the park, I just kept bringing it with me. And we haven't been going to the park as much as we used to because the kids have been um, playing outside in the cul-de-sac with the other kids a lot and the other kids have been around a ton because after school activities affect how much the other kids are around to play. So they've been playing a ton and I've just been forcing myself to work on this. And then I wound 
applying ball with all of the um, singles and I didn't let it rest because I was like if I leave this for like a week or two I'm never gonna get this plied so I applied it up immediately on my Schneider spindles steampunk which is a spindle that I usually use for applying because it's got such a long shaft but I haven't used any of my spindles for quite a long time because if you've been watching the show for a while and you've been following along it's been a while since I've had like any spindle projects on the wheel on the spindles not the wheel case in point and uh, so this is my Schneider it's 34 grams it's a 1.2 ounce spindle he signs the bottom I think of all of his spindles it's signed there I really like this spindle for plying because of all the space it's light so what I would consider a medium weight spindle I don't tend to spin any singles on this I usually use it for plying and of course I love the fact that you can see through the gear up here it was my friend Diana that introduced me to these spindles and I think Katrina has one too I really like them so um, I only have one I just love them love it so the other two I'm not sure what I'm gonna do because this is washed and finished this one's washed and finished my original plan was to knit a shawl that would feature all of these yarns and there's about a two three hundred yards of each here these are each about three hundred yards these two and I think this is because I'm taking a cue off of this one like it just took so long to finish it that I'm actually kind of thinking that I might take these remaining two and separately card them up on the drum carter and add in like some texture and some interest and just sort of add some other stuff in with them because they're not actually four ounces they're about three ounces each they're not they're not um, massive amounts of yardage so when I open this up I think you guys can probably see the blue like it's quite blue it's like a midnight blue I just love this color it's so beautiful it's a little bit compacted it's a little bit felted in places and so I that's sort of where I got the idea of maybe putting it on the drum carter and I think that's part of the reason why it took me so long to spin this because it was compacted and, and felted in places so I had to really pre-draft really 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 well but what I had sort of thought about doing was taking this fiber and and putting it on the drum carter and adding some texture so you know maybe some like naps and some sparkle and some thread, some sorry silk, I don't know, something. So, yeah, it's hard. It's hard when you run out of like your mojo for something and you run out of your enthusiasm for something and it maybe is like the, you know, the fiber's not quite right or you sort of, you're excited about something and then you run out of, out of um, enthusiasm for it or, you know, there's so, so many, many reasons why we, why we get burned out on projects but certainly with this I, I ran out of my enthusiasm for it and the funny thing is is that I spun the two colors that I liked the least so that I could save the two that I liked the best to spin and what's ended up happening is that I've still kind of run out of out of enthusiasm but I really want to get this done and I want to knit the shawl and I I uh, I need to just sort of find my my joie de vie for it again so I'm just going to tape this up so that I don't it doesn't get mixed up I'm not totally sure how you can get this fiber like if you really like it and you want some I don't actually know how you can get it there is a website here on the ball band but it's www.bastador.cl which is for Chile so b-a-s-t-i-d-o-r.cl Oh, 80 grams. That's it's not 100 grams. I, I knew it wasn't 100 grams, but that's the website there and the contact. So, contacto at bastador.cl. So, anyhow, I'm gonna move this forward, and we're just gonna talk really quickly about this. So, this was a crossbreed that I spun um, back in 2017, I think, and I knit the lemongrass sweater from it. And I have never worn it, the sweater. If anybody wants it, they can, I'll ship it to them. Um, it's size medium. Uh, it's just, 
it, it's just not my style. Um, anyways, it was a three ply cross breed. It was a local yarn, a uh, local fiber, sorry, that I spun. And um, it's been sitting in my stash and I've been looking at it because I have used it as a sample for something that I'm working on with Felicia of Sweet Georgia. And um, I love this yarn so much. Like it was one of those yarns that I spun. I spun it on my sidekick when I first got my sidekick and I spun it woolen prep but I spun it woolen, I spun it with a long draw, and then I plied it with an extra, extra, super tight ply twist. And so I had this really high twist three ply, it was really hard wearing. Uh, I, would, I would liken it to a high twist Cascade 220 and that's what it felt like. I just love this yarn. So, and I can't pull out the sweater because the body of the sweater, it felted slightly, so it won't, it, like I can't, I can't rip it and re-knit it. So anyhow, this yarn uh, has been percolating in the back of my mind and at Fibers West there was this sort of craze if you will about these shawl cuffs and I try not to buy a lot of leather products and I try to avoid it if I can and I also was sort of on a bit of a budget if you will for Fibers West and so I didn't want to I didn't want to spend anything on it I didn't want to buy buy one but I really like this style of shawl cuffs so I made one, I knit one. So I'm gonna release a blog post with this little tiny pattern. Um, <laughs> hi Diana, <laughs> we're gonna be best friends right now. That's what I call her, I call her Diana cause she's a Diana doll. Um, anyhow, I, uh, I knit this little shawl cuff and I modeled it off of the cuffs that I had seen at Fibers West and it has, she has a, it has a garter stitch border on either side of the cuff with the buttonholes and I used some old toggle buttons that were in my stash and then there's a it's a two by two rib so that it's nice and tight around the shawl and then this is my looking glass shawl which is actually featured in the book it's this pattern here in the book the looking glass shawl so I modified this a little bit to make it a lot bigger and um, knit my own shawl cuff. So I'll write up a blog post and I'll, I'll put the pattern in there. It's really simple. It's like cast on 33 stitches or 32 stitches or something. And then you knit knit the little, the little border and then the two by two rib and then cast off. And then you just have to add, put in the buttonholes where you want them. But yeah, I've worn it a few times. It looks really cool. Um, this is going to go out of focus slightly. So I'll just move her back, but you can still sort of see in the stream you can sort of see what it looks like on and I've worn it a few times I actually wore this to church on Sunday and um, oh it's really cute and you know I will say one advantage to a shawl cuff you're not constantly adjusting your shawl um, I really noticed that when I put on my shawl like it was it was sort of there for the for the rest of the morning like I, I wasn't constantly moving the shawl around and that was a really nice feeling so yeah I just wanted to share that and I'll, I'll write a blog post like I said if you want to make one so just fun fun stuff all right let's talk about the woven stole yeah it's so simple yeah thanks Florence all right this is what I've been just so excited to share with you guys so this is and I hopefully she's still around but this was hand spindle spun on my turtle made spindle and I wrote a blog post about this so if you've already heard about this I'm sorry if it's a little bit of repeat but it's spindle spun let me find the fringe so you can see the spindle spun so this is my hand spun this was sweet Georgia club from let me just look at my notes April of 2016 and um I had spun it on my turtle made spindles when they when I first got my turtle made and I had it was the sweet Georgia colorway from when her youngest Nina was born and so these were the colors that had inspired her and she was welcoming Nina into the world and so it was purples and these gorgeous turquoisey blues and there was um, some lighter purple in there and no pink just purples and blues it was just a gorgeous braid of fiber I posted it on my Instagram if you guys want to see what the actual fiber look like I posted it on my Instagram and I had found in the yarn shop in the local yarn shop I had gotten um, 
I was in there looking for some silk noil and because I would like to dye some and so I got, I got a cone of it and I was looking at all of the yarns and I found this cone of mohair merino nylon and sparkle and it's a Henry's Addict yarn and it was just sitting there and it wasn't priced and it obviously hadn't been touched yet and I showed it on the show back a little while ago and it was like $200 for the cone. Well, I'm not going to spend that on, on a cone of that. So especially because I can probably make it myself. And so I um, like the blend, I mean. And so I asked her if I could have a little bit of it off the cone. So she actually let me take the cone home, use what I want, and then I could go back and pay for it. So it ended up costing me $17 for the material that I used off of the cone. And I did this uh, 22, 22, uh, 2212. So I didn't dye the Henry's Addict yarn. I left it white, but it sparkles. And unfortunately, you can't see that on the video because it's just not, um, yeah, you just can't see that. And I'll see if I can get it into focus a little bit better. But it does sparkle, the mohair sparkle yarn. And it has this lovely halo to it because the BFL, it was a BFL silk was the hand spun so with the mohair and the bfl it just has this lovely halo it's really warm i wore it the other day and i had to take it off i i couldn't wear it it was it was way too warm but i it was my first experience using selvage a selvage a floating selvage and i called my friend fully um Felicia, my friend uh, kelsey who's a very experienced weaver and actually i'm going to give her a little bit of a plug because She's one of my close, close friends, and I love her to bits. Um, and if you're a weaver, hang on. If you're a weaver and you're looking for other really inspirational weavers to follow, please follow Kelsey because <laughs> she's amazing. So she's Kelsey Tremblet, double T. But like this is the kind of stuff that she weaves. Um, this is a shot that she did of some, I think it was cotton that she was working on or wool. She works a lot in wool. Um, anyways, Kelsey Tremblet um, on Instagram. Her stuff, her feed is so inspirational. So I called her and I, well, actually, no, I didn't. I texted her and I said, bye, Meg. And she, I said to her, um, how do I do a floating salvage if part of my warp is that those edge stitches need to be the selvage because I don't have any extra yarn because I'm working with my hand spun which she weaves with her hand spun a lot as well so that was really great because she understands about having limited yardage and I had wound a three yard warp and I had wound it until I didn't have any yarn left and so she actually said to me just unthread your two heddles on each side when you're after you after you slay your reed and everything and have everything organized, take your two side, your, your outermost um, threads, take them out of the heddles and just slay them through your reed and tie them to your front beam. And if you ever have any tensioning issues as you spin, just weight the back um, of those two threads. So I was like, oh, okay, I can do that, no problem. So that's what I did and it worked so well my edges on this are just brilliant and because I was working with my hand spun I, I didn't have any extra yarn to be able to have a separate floating salvage and I was doing this on my Jane uh, which is a table loom so I had tied up tied up I had threaded all four harnesses so I had threaded heddles on all four harnesses and um, I have found on the Jane because it's a table loom and you're constantly pulling the levers, it's just slow. It's not as fast as you're going to get on the rigid heddle if you're just doing tabby or plain weave. And it's not as fast as a floor loom because you're, you, you're not using your feet. You're, your hands are doing everything. You're throwing the shuttle, you're beating, and you're doing the lever. And so I've kind of figured out how to make that all work. But the cool thing about the twill it was really fast on the floor loom or on the table loom because you're only moving one lever. It was super, super fast. Like I had this done in about two hours, like boom, 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 boom. Like it was so fast and I didn't pull it really. The tension on the warp wasn't really, really tight because it was hand spun. It was spindle spun. Yeah, it's two ply, but I didn't pull it really super tight. But the 
The shuttle ran across it no problem. I didn't have the shuttle flying through it because I was a bit worried that it would it would go through the through the warp and it didn't at all. Um, Kelsey looked this over for me to see if she could find any mistakes and we didn't find any, which felt really good. It was a little bit of a toot toot puff puff moment. And then she was over, so she was over the day that I cut it off the loom and um, she helped me full it and finish it. So we, we washed it, we soaked it in hot water for an hour. We just left it, we kind of forgot about it and um, left it to full and it, it just really, like the yarn had already been finished so it was already poofy and I set it at 10 ends per inch which to the weavers doesn't mean a lot, but it would be like using your 10 dent heddle if you're a rigid heddle, rigid, um, rigid heddle weaver. I set it at 10 and um, so I, I knew it wasn't gonna poof to the same extent that it would if it was a weaving yarn because the hand spun had already been finished. And so I um, we left it to soak and then we towel dried it. We wrapped it in a towel and I put my knees on it on the floor and got all that extra water out. And then we threw it in the dryer. <laughs> I know, I know everybody's like, <sighs> it works really well. So we, we put it in the dryer. I set it for two minutes. And after a minute, we checked it. It was beautiful. We put it back in for another minute. And then we pulled it out. We looked at it. We put it in for another two minutes. In total, it was in the dryer for six minutes. And it came out probably 95% dry. But we knew that it would still poof a little bit. It fold perfectly. The fabric is perfect. Um, and then I left it to dry on my drying rack. So that's it. If you are threading your twill one, two, three, four, start on two and you will catch that edge automatically unless you reverse your treadling. Oh, that's a great tip, Erica. That makes a lot of sense actually. So for those who are new to weaving twill, if you are threading your twill one, two, three, four, so that's one first, second, third, fourth harness, start on number two and then you will catch your edge automatically unless you reverse your threading you're treadling. Cool. So as long as you're going in the same direction, you'll be okay. Am I correct, Erica? So unless you're doing like a diamond twill. Um, I'm just catching up with, with um, chat. Sorry guys, because they, they're talking a, a lot. You can do three shaft twills on the rigid heddle with two heddles. So Eve is asking if you can do twill on a rigid heddle. So you can, and actually, uh, Liz Gibson of the Yarn Worker and the Yarn Worker School of Weaving, she's actually doing a twill weave along right now. So that we're doing uh, napkins right now. And I don't know if I'm gonna be able to make mine, but I, I, I'm hoping that I can, but I, I'm obviously gonna do them on the Jane because I sold my rigid heddle this past weekend to be able to put the deposit down on my floor loom, which I did yesterday and um big news and so i'm going to do it on my jane but i need to get my tea towels off first and that's sort of a work in progress when it happens it happens and um she's going over how to do a twill on the rigid heddle so you've got your two heddles and you've got your you've threaded everything and then your if you think of it as one two three four your first up position on your front head on your front heddle becomes number one, your down becomes number two, and then your back becomes number three, and your down in the back becomes number four. She's really, really clear on the videos um, in explaining and your shed and beading, and it's really good. So I would definitely check out Liz Gibson and look for her twill tutorials. You'll probably have to pay. If you're a patron of hers, you get access to a lot of her content. So um, just catching up with chat. All right. Oh, good. I'm glad some of you already follow Kelsey. That's wonderful. Um, okay, we have a couple more minutes. I'll just answer a couple of these last questions. So Eve says, new loom, how exciting details. Okay, so <laughs> I wasn't going to get a floor loom, and I've been looking for one for six months secondhand, and I've been scouring Craigslist, and I've been looking online, and I was thinking about driving down to the States. There's a couple of stores down there that are bigger weaving shops than what we have up here who carry secondhand looms. And um, I was gonna drive down to, one of the shops is in Eugene, Oregon, which is about five, six hours from here, and I was gonna go down there. And yes, that's how you spell her name, Eve, that's right, for Kelsey's username. It's all one word. Um, so I was gonna drive down there, and I was gonna, um, you know, they had maybe had a couple of looms that I maybe was interested in. There was one that was listed up in Vernon, which is about three and a half, four hours away from here driving. 
Um, yeah, like I've just been scouring and looking everywhere. People have been super helpful in sending me stuff. It's just been amazing. Thank you so much to the community. And then um, I stumbled off over uh, across this woman on Ravelry who had one of the looms that I was interested in and one of the looms that I was looking at. And I um, messaged her. And I was like, hey, can you tell me a little bit more about your loom? And I just want to say, I love this community. I just, our maker community in like the weaving world and the spinning world is amazing. Like there is no reason that she had to email me back. There's no reason that she needed to like acknowledge me whatsoever. I'm Joe Blow, no one, like she doesn't know who I am. Like it's not like we're buddies. She lives in Ontario. She sent me back, honest to goodness, this Ravelry message that I had to scroll through several screens to read. It was just amazing. Like, I just, yeah, she doesn't know me. I don't know her. Anyways, she um, really helped me. Uh, she answered a lot of my questions and she, uh, I don't know anybody locally who has a couple of these looms that I was looking at. And um, I really wanted to buy Canadian made. I really wanted a Canadian loom. Um, I've been able to treadle in and uh, work at the Louette Spring a couple of times. Now I've been able to be on the David a couple of times. I've treadled on the Leclerc Colonial a couple of times now. A couple other looms. I've had the experience now with the Jane. Um, so after emailing back and forth with this woman a few times, um, we exchanged quite a number of messages. I found somebody locally who's also a dealer of all the major loom companies and all the major makers. Um, I was emailing back and forth with her and we finally just got onto the phone a few weeks ago and had like a two hour conversation and she was giving me information that I hadn't even thought about. Like she was talking about like sectional warping versus not sectional warping and like whether or not to get a sectional beam and whether or not to do this and whether or not to do that. It was just, just awesome. So forthcoming with her knowledge. And of course, talking to my friend Jeanette and talking to my friend Felicia and bouncing ideas with Katrina because she will eventually uh, get a floor loom. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to email Francois at Leclerc directly. I'm just going to see what he says. <laughs> and he emailed me back twice. So that's what I did. And so I'm actually, uh, I put a deposit down on a Leclerc eight shaft countermarsh. So we'll see. I'll have it sometime in the summer. I'm not going to get it shipped um, anytime soon. So I had to moderate a message. That's the first time I've had to moderate <laughs> in the chat because somebody wanted to share a link and I had to moderate. That's very cool. Uh, so anyways, that's what I've chosen. Um, it's been a lot of like back and forth and trying to figure out and balance uh, costs and financial uh, thoughts versus, um, versus other considerations. What I want to weave, um, the experiences I've had thus far. So anyways, weevolution.com has been a great resource and a great help. And um, there's a couple of Ravelry groups in, in, uh, for weavers that have been really helpful. And um, there's really not a lot of information about floor looms out there. I'm really surprised at the lack of information. You want to search a spinning wheel? There is tons of information out there. But weaving looms, it's a little bit more difficult. I don't know if that's because the demographic that's weaving is not online or if there's these sort of more quote unquote modern looms and that's kind of what people are talking about. I, I don't know. I would love to hear what you guys think because there's not a ton of information out there. Um, there's not a lot of YouTube videos about weaving and about what people are using and doing. A lot of people are more talking about what they're weaving. Uh, there's a couple of really great demo videos out there for the Louette David and the Louette Spring, but there's not a whole lot else. Um, yeah, I would, I just would love to know why, if it's a demographic thing, if it's an age thing, there's just not enough of us in this real tech generation that are talking about it and making videos. There's no podcasts. Um, the Weave podcast by Just Yarn. She's located, um, I think she's just outside of Boston. She's one of the only weaving podcasts that I was able to find. It's an audio podcast. Yeah, I know Erica has a podcast. Um, I have it written down. What's the name of your podcast, Erica? Um, Fiber at the Speed of Life. So that's going to be a very weaving heavy podcast, I suspect, Erica, just because Erica's main thing is weaving. Yeah, so, um, yeah, somebody was wondering, so Kelly was saying, I wonder if it's a demographic thing. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I would love to know because, um, yeah, there, it's really hard to find information. So 
I'm so glad you made your loom choice. I was so excited to see your loom and to see you work on it. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, I'm really excited. I um, It's a big purchase. It's a big purchase. And uh, I wanted to make one purchase. We're bringing one loom into the house. It will be a one-time thing. <laughs> and that'll be it. So, all right, we need to go. It's almost time for me to go and pick up Nora. It's been a really long stream today. I know there's been a little bit of technical difficulty with it coming in and out. Um, Kelly Casanova on YouTube is great. Um, you're right, uh, Case, uh, Cassie, Casey, Casey. Um, she's got some great tutorials. She weaves on Alouette David, um, and she also has a floor, a table loom that she uses sometimes, and she's, she's a great resource. Um, but she's really one of the only ones um, who's doing stuff. So I know Chrissy, my friend Chrissy, who vlogs over at Snappy Stitches. She had a weave podcast for a little bit, but I know that's something that she's sort of moved away from recently because they're in the throes of newborns and babies and just a difficult stage of life. So, um, which is too bad. I would love to see her have a weaving podcast and to be on her floor loom. But I think she sold her floor loom um, last time I talked to her. So... Yeah, I mean, they take up a lot of space. They're expensive in terms of an investment. Even if you get a secondhand one, you're probably replacing parts. And um, there's the, I think the space issue is a huge issue. One of the girls at work said to me, because um, she saw me knitting on something and she thought I was weaving. And so she said, oh, what are you weaving? And I said, well, actually, this is knitting. And she, said, and she was asking me what the differences were. And so I told her and um, she said, well, who has room for that? And I thought, yeah, totally. So... Uh, my husband just laughed so hard at one loom in the house. We do not keep an official count on the number of looms I own. You know what, Erica? It's so funny because I just I was just chatting with you the other day, and um, Mike has like hard and fast one loom. So when the when the Leclerc comes in, the Jane goes out. Like he is like, <laughs> I have had. I think I've reached his limit. And actually, he's been super happy because I sold two of my four spinning wheels. So I'm down to two wheels. I'm going to stay at two wheels. It's been really liberating for me not to have so many wheels around. And um, uh, <laughs> we literally don't have the space. Like, we do not have the space. So I'm hoping that that actually helps me to keep me focused over the next couple of years around what I want to spend my time making and what it is that I want to spin for. I didn't talk about it today, but I will next show. Um, I'm plying, it's just back here, I won't grab it, my Shetland that I've been spinning, I'm plying that up into my two ply to start sampling it. And I'm not going to sample it until I have my Leclerc because that's the loom that I'm going to weave that fabric on. But I've been spinning that yarn for that project and it's a massive spin and I was thinking, you know, this is really what I want to be doing. I don't need multiple pieces of equipment to make that one piece of cloth. So it's been really helpful to kind of hone in on what it is that I want to be doing. So yeah, we, we just don't have space. Unless I kicked Mike out and we didn't have a bed anymore or the kids shared a room, that would work. If I put the kids in the same room and I put them in a bunk, then I could have a loom room. That's an option. <laughs> Anyways. Oh, Becca, interesting. So Becca said, um, all the weavers I know here in Scotland rarely do anything online. Some blog, but it's almost all in person. So that's our, our guild. Almost everybody who's a weaver in our guild is strictly in person, or they might have a blog, but most of them know. Uh, Sarah Lamb comes to mind. She's got a really great blog. Um, but again, she's not really on any other social media, although she's a wealth of information. SarahLamb.com, S-A-R-A, -A, no H. Um, there's, uh, and yeah, so it's sort of the next generation now that needs to start getting online and helping others like in the spinning community, like what's happened in the spinning community. We need to start getting online and helping people. I think that's why Liz Gibson and what she's been doing with the rigid huddle, it's so accessible and it's so positive. So I really commend those who are, who are trying to make weaving more mainstream. All right. I think that's everything. I'm looking at the time, I'm looking at chat. I'm, I, I think it's time to say goodbye. We've got three live streams this month, so the fun is not gonna end anytime soon. I will see you guys in two weeks, and this show will be released to the public on Saturday morning this week, so it will be, I think it's May 5th. We have the Sheep to Shawl, our guild. If you're local to Vancouver, okay, one last plug. If you are local to Vancouver, um, this Saturday at 10 a.m. at the Surrey Museum, which is in Cloverdale. It's on Highway 10. 
Um, I might release this show on Friday actually so that those who are local and are watching this have a chance to plan. Um, we're doing a sheep to shawl. There's at least two guilds participating. I think there might be three. And um, yeah, we'll be uh, um, spinning, prepping, spinning and weaving um, in the local sheep to shawl. So please come to the Surrey Museum this weekend if you can on Saturday. And for patrons, the show will be released tonight. So if you missed some of the show or you couldn't watch the whole live stream, you can, you'll be able to see it tonight. All right, guys, until next time, I'll see you in two weeks. Have a wonderful couple of couple of days and uh, happy spinning and happy weaving. And thank you so much for spending some time with me. Bye, everyone.